comrades and friends, on behalf of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist Leninist, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to this meeting. The occasion for this meeting was the birthday of Comrade Kim Il-sung, the great leader of the Korean people. But it's what better day could we find to discuss the very, very grave situation um, on the Korean Peninsula, whereby the actions of United States imperialism and its satellites and puppets are threatening to destabilize not only the Korean Peninsula, but the whole um, of the region, including China. And who is to say what, where these provocations and their consequences end? And progressive people around the world have a duty to actually stand up and start raising their voices and say that what US imperialism and its satellites are doing is wrong. If you look at the news media in Western Europe, you'd think there are these lovely little Americans trying to bring democracy everywhere. Killing four million here, two million here, three million here, 10,000 here, 20,000 there. They've been bringing democracy for over 100 years, if not longer. And they've caused devastation and they cause a great deal of damage, damage to humanity. In fact, ever since the end of the First World War, but specifically since the end of the Second World War, American imperialism has actually functioned as a gendarme of world reaction and as a hangman of the liberation struggles and the struggles for emancipation of the proletariat. That has been its role, and we need to expose that role. Korea is a tiny little place, especially the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is a tiny place with a population of 22 to 23 million. Its size is the size of Wales. It threatens nobody. It does not present any danger to any anyone. Americans are, have been conducting war against the Korean people ever since 1950 and indirectly ever since 1945. They have conducted this war and during the war of 1950 to 53, they killed 4 million Koreans. They slaughtered them for no other reason than they wanted to fight for a particular kind of social, social system. They wanted to have independence. They didn't want America, the benefits of American democracy imposed on them. Ever since July 53, there has been an armistice signed between the DPRK and, 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 the, and the US. There is no peace treaty between the two countries. The DPRK has been demanding that a peace treaty be signed between the two countries. DPRK has no other dispute with the United States than the fact that the United States is occupying more than half of Korea, and what's more, is occupying with the most modern, up-to-date, and most destructive uh, armament. If there was to be peace in the, on the Korean Peninsula, if there was to be a peace treaty between the United States of America and DPRK, there would be no excuse for American troops to be posted there. They do not want peace for the simple reason that they do not want to leave the Korean Peninsula. Hi, comrade. Uh, uh, You'll be pleased to know the Korean ambassador is here. Please, please come over here. So, if there was to be a peace treaty between the United States of America and the DPRK, the United States would have no excuse to stay on the Korean Peninsula. They want to stay there. This provocation, murderous provocation, has been carried on for 60 years. If you look at the media reports of what is happening on the Korean Peninsula, you'd think the North, North Koreans were mad, mad. You would think that the DPRK was ruled by nutcases. Every single person who is totally ignorant of the geography of the world, who's never looked at the map, who doesn't know where Korea is, 
who does not know where the United States is, has become an expert on Korea. I go to my barber, and the barber says, this nut job, the leader of the Korean people, is going to blow up the world. I said, how is North Korea going to blow up the world? North Koreans, until about a few years ago, didn't have any nuclear weapons. Now the American imperialists have got to excuse that North Koreans got nuclear weapons. They didn't leave them alone when they had nuclear weapons. They don't leave them alone when they've got nuclear weapons. There are literally a thousand nuclear weapons on the soil of Korea, and 99.98% of those belong to the United States. United States has no right to bring nuclear weapons to other countries and impose their occupation. Now, if the North Koreans had taken even two nuclear bombs and installed them somewhere in Miami, you would think that North Koreans <coughs> were acting rather provocatively. And then we would want to find out whether the Americans would like the benefits of North Korean democracy or not. But yet they have the arrogance to feel that they have the right to impose their system on other people. Korean people say they have paid with the blood of millions of people to live there, liberate their country, first from Japanese imperialism, then from United States imperialism. No thank you. We have had the benefits of this democracy. We lost 4 million people in the Korean War. We don't want this. Will you please leave us alone? That's all they want. That's all they want. What is happening? How would the United States of America feel <clears throat> if, for example, another country was doing dummy runs as, in order to actually have practice for a nuclear attack on the country on whose borders they were doing these dummy runs? And that's what they're doing. They're trying to frighten the North Koreans into submission. But North Koreans are made of sterner stuff. They will not submit. We know the North Koreans, they have given proof of their resilience, they have given proof of their independence, they have given proof of their desire to stick to their own social system. They will not submit, no matter what powers are facing them. John Kerry, the allegedly dovish <laughs> Secretary of the United States of America goes and threatens Korea. He has no ability to threaten anybody in the United States. But he goes 10,000 miles away to threaten North Korea. They go to the borders of North and South Korea in the same way that John Foster Dulles used to go before the Korean War started. They're indulging in every possible provocation. And if the Koreans then respond to it, they're told the Koreans are bellicose. In my language, in Punjabi, there's a saying, I come and throttle you. I press on your throat. And then you show me your eyes. Well, the natural reaction of a person who is being throttled is to open his eyes. Uh, and then say, don't do that, because it's very threatening to me. <laughs> they're, 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 they're trying to threaten the North Koreans. And they're expecting them to meekly submit. And they say, thank you very much. Please carry on. Do, do this, because we like it very much. Of course they don't like it very much. They are spending a disproportionate amount of money on defending themselves against a monstrous imperialist power. They, like all other socialist countries, they would rather spend their material resources to build a happier life for their own people. They're not building nuclear weapons because it's a matter of pride to build nuclear weapons. They're building them as a matter of necessity. We, along with the comrades from the DPRK, say we are in favor of getting rid of these monstrous weapons. We are in favor of getting rid of nuclear armaments. But this can only be done if there's a universal nuclear and verifiable and non-discriminatory disarmament whereby every country disarms. They tell you nuclear weapons are safe in our hands because we are responsible, we are democratic countries. Whereas other countries, the PRK, before that, the Soviet Union, they are threatening people. We, we, they can be expected to use these weapons. Well, the proof of the pudding is there's been only twice the use of nuclear weapons. That 
use was by the United States of America. And that use was at a time when its victims could not answer back in kind. The Koreans have learned that. <coughs> Madam Albright, another former Foreign Secretary of the United States, said, and these are her words, not mine, Iraq was invaded because it had no nuclear weapons. North Korea is not invaded because it had nuclear weapons. It's not my position that that's the only way to prevent nuclear, uh, 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 aggression. There are all kinds of other circumstances. But one thing that does make them think twice is they can hit back. If you come and punch me every day and I see it, aren't you encouraged to come and punch me again? But if I punch you back, you think twice before you hit me. And the North Koreans are saying, if you hit us, we will hit back. That's all they are saying. <laughs> they are not saying that they will hit first. United States of America actually does not subscribe to the notion of never being the first to use nuclear weapons. It does not do that because nuclear weapons lose all threatening power if you say we won't be the first to use it. But why are you having it? American imperialism has conducted its diplomacy on the basis of nuclear weapons ever since the year 1945. And they already had become very truculent at the Potsdam Conference. When they met Joseph Stalin in Tehran, in Yalta, <coughs> they were very well behaved. But at Potsdam, they had become very arrogant. By that time, Roosevelt had died and his place had been take, take, taken by Harry S. Truman. And Truman was very arrogant. All the agreements that had been made earlier were sought to be overridden. And the Soviet Union knew why, why not. At one of the meetings, at one of the sessions, uh, when they were breaking up for lunch, Truman called through an interpreter, Stalin, and said, Mr. Secretary, uh, General Secretary, we wish to inform you that we've got this terrible weapon. And according to reporters who were present there, Stalin didn't bat an eyelid and said, thank you, Mr. President, for informing me. He turned his back and went away to his room of error. And of course, straight away, Stalin gave instructions to his Minister of Heavy Industry, Comrade, we must have a socialist bomb. If peace has been maintained in the world ever since the Americans invented the nuclear weapons, it has been because of the weapons of the Soviet Union and because of the weapons of other socialist countries. It's not imperialism's weapons that are keeping the world safe. It is the socialist countries' weapons that are keeping the world safe. <laughs> Finally, comrades, I appeal to you and this is the purpose of this meeting, to send a message. We may be small, we may not be ruling party, but in expressing the views that we do, we represent the sentiments of the overwhelming majority of humanity, not just in this country, but all over the world. <laughs> and these sentiments are American imperialism, British imperialism, and their satellites and puppets should desist from any provocations which threaten the survival of humanity. And we stand shoulder to shoulder with our Korean comrades to say, whatever little power we have, we will be there to stand with them shoulder to shoulder. Whatever the cost to us, we will defend, defend them. I do that all, all the time. My comrades do it all the time. And you only have to talk to people for five minutes and give them facts. People are quite actually amenable to reason. They've never heard re reasonable statements. And it is our sad situation that the working class movement has been so gutted, partly by the peculiar circumstances of prosperity produced in the aftermath of the Second World War in Western Europe and America, and partly as a result of the ravages of Khrushchevite revisionism, which has gutted the movement, so that the only people who have a say in the working class movement are the social democrats, revisionists, and Trotskyites. And we need to build this movement we want all of our comrades and friends to help us build a party of the proletariat which can do right things, which can mobilize millions of people. If we were in a position to mobilize millions of people in this country and say, 
leave Korea alone, our ruling class would not dare to actually have even high terms. <laughs> it is partly our weakness, and we are actually bitterly aware of this, this weakness. And because we are aware of it, we have every intention of wanting to put it right. So give us a hand in building a movement that would be worthy of the name of calling itself proletarian. you for coming in support of the um, people of the VPRK who in standing against American imperialism are standing for the whole of humanity. They're not standing just for Korea. And when we give the support to the DPRK, we're not doing it out of humanitarian reasons. Of course humanitarian reasons affect us just as much as they affect the people of DPRK. It is because it is in our interest that the DPRK should not in any way be harmed. It should not fall to the blows of imperialism, because if it falls, we will all suffer as a result of it. <laughs> that, is, that, that is the basis of our solidarity. I've already taken too much of your time. We have speakers who have agreed to speak on the question of the situation in Korean Peninsula, as well as, of course, in connection with the birthday of the great leader of the Korean people, Comrade Kim, Kim Il-sung. And with these words, I welcome not only our speakers, but Comrade Ambassador of the DPR.